Yeah. Let me get us started. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today's uh, Safari seminar. Today is my great pleasure to introduce you, Dr. Hayu Mao. Uh, Hayu joined our group as a senior researcher, Safari Research Group, uh, since September 2020. She got her PhD from Tsinghua University in China. And uh, her interest is in intersection of uh, processing memory and bioinformatics. And today she's going to present her work in Micro 2022. I would feel free to start. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Mohammed. Uh, hello, everyone. And it's my great pleasure to be here to present our paper, Gene PIP, in memory acceleration of genome analysis. We apply to integration of base calling and remapping. And this paper is published in Micro 2022. And first, I want to give an overview of uh, the background and uh, uh, the uh, motivations of our work. So first of all, genome analysis enables us to determine the order of DNA sequence in an organism's genome. And it plays an important role in the personalized medicine, outbreak tracing, understanding evolution, and so on. So the modern, uh, Genome sequencing mach machines, they extract small randomized fragments of the original DNA sequence, which is known as reads. And here is an example of the, a device from the Oxford Nanopore Technologies, which is also known as ONT. And it's a widely used uh, sequencing technology because it's a portable, it provides portable sequencing devices and it has high throughput, also it's cheap. However, uh, in today's, uh, in, in the state of art genome analysis pipelines, there are two main limitations. Uh, we may know that there are multiple steps in the genome analysis. However, there are large data movements between the multiple steps. And also, there's a lot of wasted computation done on the data that is later discovered to be useless. So that's why we propose GenePIP. GenePIP is a fast and energy efficient in memory acceleration system for the genome analysis pipeline. We are tight integration of the genome analysis steps. GenePIP has two key techniques. The first one is the trunk based pipeline, which provides the fine grained collaboration of genome analysis steps. And the second one is early rejection, which timely stops the, the execution on the useless data by predicting which reads will not be useful. GMP Power performs a state-of-art software and hardware solutions using CPU, GPU, and the optimistic PIM um, by 41% uh, for, uh, 41 times and 8 times and uh, 1.4 times respectively. So here is our outline of today's talk. Firstly, I will go through the background and motivation. Here, I want to give you an overview of the genome sequencing and the analysis steps. First, we get some samples. Then we do some preparation, get the chopped DNA fragments. And then the fragments are, uh, goes to the, uh, go into the sequencing machine. Then we get the sequenced reads. Finally, we do the genome sequencing analysis. Here is a little bit more detail about the ONT, especially the ONT genome sequencing and the analysis pipeline. First, we get the uh, we do the genome uh, ONT genome sequencing, and we get the uh, raw signal data here, and we store the raw signal data in the storage. Then we read it out to the uh, computation units to do the first step in the ONT genome analysis, which is called as base calling. In the base calling step, we translate the raw signals into the basis, which is ACGT here, and we translate them. Uh, in, in the granulatal trunks. And after we translate all of the trunks, we get a read. And after we base call all of the reads, we store them in the storage and continue with the next step, which is known as the read quality control. In the read quality control, we can tell it it's a high quality or low quality reads. If it's low quality reads, then we discard it. If it's high quality, then we store the, all of the high quality reads to continue with the next stop. 
and the, uh, the short search stop is known as the uh, read mappings. In the read mapping, we compare the reads to the reference genome. Uh, and then to tell it can be mapped or not. If it can be, uh, if it cannot be mapped, then we discard it. And if it can be mapped to the reference genome, then we store the uh, map information to the results to the storage. So here is the overview of the ONT genome analysis pipeline. Uh, okay, then let's go to a little bit detail about each uh, steps. The, the first step is base calling. Base calling usually it use deep neural networks to ensure the base call, uh, base calling accuracy. Here is a base caller, and basically we have the raw signals as the input in the trunks, and then we pro uh, process it by translate the raw signals into bases, which is ACGT, and calculate also at the same time calculate the um, the uh, quality of each base. And uh, then we output the assembled trunks into a long read and along with the base colleagues. So the sorry. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. So I had a question in the previous slide. Yeah. Can you comment on the other base calling techniques? I mean, so you are saying that we use DNM based uh, base calling to provide high accuracy. Yeah. So I mean other base calling techniques that they don't use DNM. How inaccurate are they? And also the, the trade-off between the performance and accuracy, if you have something to share. And also I'd like to know uh, if we need actually high accurate base calling every in all cases, basically. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. Oh, so yeah, actually, my question is a bit similar. Maybe you can answer. Yeah, yeah, sure. But do all these all of these base callers use the data in chunks? Uh, or like is there a base caller that can take the entire raw signal and then do the base calling? Uh, so basically, what are the differences between base calls? Okay, let, okay, thanks for the question. Let, let me firstly answer Mohammed's question. So, uh, yes, there are many situations that we can use uh, different base callers. In the situation that we want to do a very accurate analysis, um, then we need a high accuracy base caller. But we also have some situations such as the, we want to um, uh, analyze the base call the only the uh, virus, for example, the virus uh, uh, genomes from uh, environment, but we the virus genomes is mixed with the human genomes. Then we only want to de um, detect the, the virus genomes. Then we ha can have a kind of a, like a base color, which is not very uh, with high accuracy as a filter that we can field some um, human genome and to focus on the uh, virus genome. We have a paper that uh, from Banu and in our group that is called the uh, target core, and uh, expl it explains the, the technique much better than uh, in detail uh, in this area. And uh, so uh, to answer uh, John's question, uh, since we, uh, the ONT reads are all long, long reads and they in different uh, lenses. So we can, Actually, the DNN, uh, the size of the DNN is limited, the input of the size. And also, we don't, we, you cannot uh, say like uh, uh, for uh, every read, read, we design a, a particular DNN for this read. So we need to fix the input size. That's why we need to trunk the uh, reads in, into uh, the, the small trunks to uh, base call it. Yeah. Thank you. So one question, like, um, if, if, if you have the signal and then you chunk it, it means like they can be, um, let's say, featured in the, in the DNN that sometimes are empty because you chunk it, you chunk it, but you, how do you always fit out the feature in the DNA by chunking, for example? You mean that we may lose some information at the end and uh, at the beginning of the, of the yeah yeah right. depending on how you chunk it for example you you assume like you feed the signal yeah actually uh, we had uh, uh, some analysis about different trunk size and uh, it shows that uh, the accuracy uh, doesn't change uh, doesn't change too much uh, between the uh, threshold usually uh, for the for example, for the uh, 
Bonito that's recommended by the ONT company. And the, the recommendation, uh, the, the uh, recommended uh, size is uh, 300 basis. And the from, we test from 300 basis to uh, 500 basis to see the difference. Actually, there's no, um, not much uh, accuracy difference uh, when we use different trunk size. But when we use smaller trunk size, uh, there may uh, actually uh, for the smaller one, we have a large uh, accuracy loss because um, they cannot get enough information uh, around this range. So there's some trade off inside it, and we use the uh, recommendation, the recommended uh, size as our baseline, and we also tested the range of it. Yeah, in the paper. And you can find uh, more details in the paper. Okay, is there any questions about the base calling step? Okay, and I continue with the second step, which is the read quality control. In the read quality control, uh, as I said before, we have the long reads along with the base quality scores for each base. And uh, in the uh, read quality control, we use the um, base quality scores as an input. And we calculate the average of the base quality score as the read quality score. And we compare the read quality score to the threshold to decide whether this read is the low quality or high quality. And the output is the high quality reads. And we discuss the low quality reads here. One question in the yeah. quality control. Um, it is like discarded based on the number of wrong bases in the read. Or also the position where you find. No, no, no. We only here we only calculate the average of oh, the right. base quality scores. Right. We only uh, sum up and uh, calculate the average, and uh, to see the uh, to give a read quality score and judge it. We don't like to uh, complex computing here. Yeah. So is it the only way to, I mean, calculate the overall quality score? I mean. Calculating the average, or there are also some other way to combine uh, quality score for different bases. Uh, I mean, yeah, this is the popular way to do it, and uh, we ba basically in this paper we propose some uh, ways to predict the quality scores. Okay. Yeah, I will talk it later. So, do you have any problems about the read quality control? Okay, then I continue with the third step. So the third step is read mapping. First, we have a index step, which is already done. Um, we transfer the reference genome to using the subsequence in the reference genome and the locations in the, uh, of the subse subsequence in the reference genome and the create a, a hash table of the reference genome. So the input of the read mapping step is the high quality long reads passes the read quality control step. And uh, the process is firstly, we use the subsequence in a read to query the hash table to get the possible match locations. And then uh, we identify the candidate regions and output the chaining score, which is a chaining step in the read mapping. And finally, we execute the alignment step if there is a chain. So they are basically uh, three main steps in the read mapping, which is seeding, chaining, and alignment. And the indexing is done uh, before the read mapping. Okay. So here, and we have the um, read can be mapped to the re reference genome or cannot be mapped to the reference genome. And it outputs the mapping information in detail. So, uh, in those, all of the uh, genome, ONT genome analysis steps, we found two limitations. First of all, uh, there's a large data movement. And we, here we use a, a human data set as an example to explain more detail in, in the, this limitation. Uh, first, we, um, from the nanopore sequencing machine, we get the raw signals, which is uh, uh, in this, in this example, it's about uh, uh, 4,000 gigabytes. And then we do uh, 500,000 gigabytes. And then we uh, go through the read call control. And we 
filled out some low quality reads. We stored the uh, high quality reads, with, which is around uh, 437 uh, gigabytes. And then we continue with the read mapping. Of that, we have the, we get the, all of the mapped reads, which is around uh, 380 uh, gigabytes. So as you can see here, uh, during these steps, there are many large data movements between genome analysis steps. And the, the second limitation we found is that uh, there's a lot of wasted computation. Uh, so here also we use the same human data set as example. After the base calling, we have all of the reads, but uh, when we go through the record control, we only keep the high quality reads, which means uh, we discard the low quality reads, but it's already uh, goes through the base calling step and already did a lot of computation on it. And then we do the read mapping, we get the mapped reads, but it's only uh, less than 70% of the useful information. So here uh, we conclude that there's a considerable amount of computation on useless data because of the low quality reads or unmapped reads. No one question? Yeah, sure. Um, those low quality reads that uh, get rejected early, they case they can some sort contribute as a cover in a downstream analysis, for example, in viral calling. Um, neglecting rejecting some of them, did they see any loss of accuracy in downstream analysis like viral calling, for example? Yeah, the problem is that because there are many errors in that such kind of low quality reads. So uh, according to those uh, bioinformatics papers that we found that uh, we can actually get a uh, uh, very um, less information from those low quality reads. Uh, and also if we consider those low quality reads in the uh, analysis, it can disturb us about the results yeah. because we don't have like, uh, we don't trust the translation output of the Okay. Uh, locally. But there, there is any sort of studies, for example, that show you how many errors are necessary to make a read completely unmapped, let's say, to a location which it cannot contribute as a cover at all? Uh, I'm, I don't know such kind of work. Yeah, but I believe that uh, because we have the errors from the machines, we also have errors when, do, when we do the base calling. Because you could have some errors across, let's say, like 10 bases, but if your read is long, the rest of the bases that are partly of high quality can still be covered for all the yeah, I mean, Yeah, in that, in that uh, case, then because there's only, uh, as you say, said before, there's only like several bases with uh, low quality, but other bases are high quality. Then the average of the reads should be the high quality reads. There's a uh, uh, a statistics analysis on, on these things, and they recommend we use the uh, average quality score of seven as a threshold. Yeah, they did a lot of analysis on it to say, okay, um, this kind of uh, reads can be used for this kind of reason. So, yeah. So basically, high quality reads doesn't mean that they are also error free. They may have also error -free. Yes, yes, sure. But I mean, the, the overall quality is higher it's than the threshold. Yeah, yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, sure. More basic question. So the uh, reads that come out of a sequencing machine are not in any particular order. No, no, that they're is not. The reason you're doing all of this. Yes, yes. Uh, in the, so pre the reason why they cannot produce it in a certain order, or maybe they can have some kind of an index which says this is the order of these uh, reads, right? So that will uh, reduce the effort needed for these further steps. Yeah, it's uh, about biomedic things, and uh, uh, currently we don't have a technology to yeah, sequence it in order. Isn't there difficulty in having such? Uh, yeah, this is not about the computation side uh, yeah. effort. This is uh, uh, on the other side, and uh, yeah, if you're interested, in it, you can you can yeah have a look at the those really. I guess John, can you can add something. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. This is a one billion dollar question, by the way. <laughs> 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 so if you can do it, definitely. Why it's not enabled? Not enabled to do it. 
I know it's not there. But... And you're asking all the reasons, I guess. Why is it? Yeah, so uh, first of all, uh, it's not possible currently to read the entire genome because uh, the enzymes or uh, the technology that we're using in the sequencing, these sequencing technologies are like, those are basically varying out in time. So they are not really capable of like generating useful information for a long time for a large number of phases due to like several reasons affecting that technology. For example, uh, 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 there's an enzyme uh, called DNA polymerase and it's basically supposed to generate uh, lights as basically you uh, uh, sequence the DNA, but it wears out in time, so it becomes unreliable uh, after some point. So we need to basically really work on um, uh, smaller fragments, let's say. And since we know that these uh, DNAs can be only read like with smaller fragments, then what we do is basically we first chop them literally before putting them in the sequencing machines. And then we put them in chops to the machine. So you have a solution with a pool of DNA. So they are literally basically flowing around in your sample, but you don't really know which part of that particular uh, DNA is going to be read first because of the physical uh, forces that you have in the solution. Yeah, also uh, one thing to add up uh, complete like uh, the answer, like uh, when we do the ONT sequencing, it's also uh, the technology can be, um, the device can be worn out in maybe uh, 48 uh, hours. And we also uh, discover that um, at the end of the uh, sequencing, the quality is actually usually like low. So we cannot trust it. Yeah. Okay, do you have any other questions about this slide? Okay, then I continue. So, um, so let me talk a little bit uh, about the state of art works. And uh, uh, the NVM based PIM, the non auto memory based PIM, is an efficient technique to reduce the data movement. Uh, by processing data using or near the memory. So there are some efforts uh, to do uh, processing using memory um, for the base calling. Uh, here is a paper that the, the, do the uh, processing using memory uh, for the vector matrix multiplication uh, operations and uh, used to use it to accelerate the base calling step. And here I want to mention a little bit about this technique. Um, the basically we have a uh, um, uh, NVM metric, uh, NVM arrays, and we store the uh, neural network weight in in the arrays, and then we put uh, add a voltage on each word line, and then we uh, through a recycle we can send in the uh, bit line voltage, and uh, it's done a uh, matrix uh, vector multiplication in just one recycle. So it's very efficient. And uh, because the vector matrix multiplication is the dominant operation in the neural network applications, and we can also add some preferred circuits to support other operations that, that is uh, uh, in the neural networks, and then we accelerate the base calling. There are actually many works about the, uh, the uh, processing using memory to accelerate the uh, neural networks. And also on this other side, um, for the read mapping, we can also use the uh, OVM based CAM arrays. Uh, this paper uh, does some OVM based CAM arrays for the search and addition operations, and uh, which is the dominant operations in the read mapping uh, step. And uh, uh, since it has a very high parism, so we can uh, have a very high uh, compute, uh, computing throughput, then we can accelerate the remapping. Uh, so uh, for the base calling and remapping, which are the most time consuming steps in the pipeline, uh, we have uh, different accelerators, uh, different state of our works to accelerate. However, uh, it only reduces the data movement in a single uh, genome analysis step. And also, uh, through like accelerating these two time consuming steps, 
it exacerbates the data movement overhead between the anal uh, analysis steps. And we conclude that there's uh, no prior work tackles data movement between analysis steps and reduce the useless computations. So our goal and uh, object, our goal is to Sorry. if, yes. Uh, so about your maybe previous slides and actually one of the slides that you showed mm -hmm. earlier. So among all of these steps in the entire pipeline, which step is the most time consuming step, including the sequencing part? Yeah, it depends, uh, the base calling and uh, including the sequencing yes. step. Okay. Uh, let me think about it. I don't have a number so about the sequencing step in, in the top of my mind, but uh, uh, like uh, the analysis steps, are like a kind of uh, uh, equivalent time consuming compared to the sequencing step. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it's kind of like a sequencing the throughput, we can increase the number of devices of the uh, the nanopore cells to increase the increase the uh, sequencing throughput, and also the actually the throughput is very high. And uh, um, so for the analysis steps, uh, the base calling and read mapping are the most time consuming, and uh, it depends on different like uh, uh, settings. But usually the base calling kind of uh, take. Uh, 50% of the runtime and uh, remapping may take like a 40% around these uh, things. So let's, if you assume that the sequencing, let's say, is taking the maybe more than the half of the entire uh, time, let's say, of this yeah. entire analysis, does it really make sense to accelerate any of these steps? Let's assume that like we, uh, we were basically consuming, let's say, zero time for all of these analysis. So do you see ways of reducing the uh, sequencing time as well? So I'm saying this because of the unknowns, right? So if basically we have the at least a half of the time spending on the sequencing time, right? Are there ways of also like accelerating or somehow overlapping the latency? on the sequencing part with the analysis part? Yeah, yeah, that, that's a really good question. Actually, we doing this in real time. Mm -hmm. And uh, once, before we do like step by step, so once we get all of the reads sequenced and we store in the storage and do the step one by one, and the, the state of art technologies in the industry, it's like uh, uh, usually we do the base calling and we call it in the, uh, wet lab, which, which is together, maybe together with the sequencing machine, and we do the read mapping, read quality control read mapping in other uh, clusters or in the cloud. So we do, before we do it uh, really step by step, but in this work, we pipeline them. Like once we get the uh, sequence, uh, sequenced uh, reads and uh, we do the analysis, and it, uh, uh, the quality, uh, the, the quality is not high or the reads cannot be mapped to the reference genome, then we can reject it and to reduce the time of sequence. And is the analysis usually done once? Like for example, we know that sequencing is done once, right? First yeah, time. sequencing is done once, but the analysis usually you can done, uh, do many times and we can also keep the information in the storage, mm -hmm. in the memory, yeah, to keep analysis. So uh, let me continue with our goal. So our goal in this paper is to efficiently accelerate the entire genome analysis pipeline while minimizing the data movement and the useless computation. So we perform a study to quantify the potential benefits uh, and the results are normalized to the performance of GPU. So firstly, we uh, do the analysis on the OEM-based PIM accelerators for the separate base calling and read mapping. And it can achieve uh, 2.7 times speed up compared to GPU. And next we assume there's no data movement between the accelerators of analysis steps. Then it can achieve uh, six times speed up over GPU. And last, we, uh, we, we assume that there's no data movement and also there's no resource reads in the 
uh, which is the ideal case in the uh, pipeline. And it can achieve nine times speed up over GP. So as you can see, we have a lot of uh, opportunity here. So then let me talk a little bit uh, detail of the gene pip. So gene pip is the first holistic in-memory accelerator for genome uh, analysis pipeline, including the base calling, read quality control, and read mapping steps. Gene pip has two key techniques. Oh, oh, oh. Sorry. Uh, the voice is a little bit low. Coming. Maybe you can increase the speaker volume. Okay, that's better now. Oh, yes. Okay, okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now we can hear. But yeah, if you could start from the slide again, that'd be good. Uh, this one? No, the next one, yeah. Okay. So let me uh, repeat again. So GenePip is the first holistic in-memory accelerator for genome analysis pipeline, including base calling, read call control, and read mapping steps. And GenePip has two key techniques, trunk-based pipeline and the early rejection. So let me uh, firstly uh, talk about the trunk-based pipeline. Trunk-based pipeline enables the fine-grained pipelining of genome analysis steps, and it processes reads at trunk granularity. Um, for example, it's uh, 300 basis. So uh, trunk-based pipeline increases the parism by overlapping the execution of different steps at the trunk granularity, and trunk-based pipeline reduces the intermediate data by uh, computing on data as soon as the data is generated. Trunk-based pipeline also provides opportunities for the early rejection by analyzing the uh, read at the trunk granularity. So here we uh, use the read, which is consists of four trunks, C1 to C4, as an example to explain uh, the trunk-based pipeline technique in detail. So in the conventional pipeline, we do the base calling on the trunks one by one. After we finish all of the uh, base calling of the trunks, then we assemble them into a read, and then we do the read call, uh, quality control on the read, and we do the read mapping on the read. In our trunk-based pipeline, firstly, we do the base calling, and uh, after we, uh, when we do the next uh, base calling of the next uh, trunks, and at the same time, we do the read quality control, uh, the, the trunk quality control of the first base called uh, trunk. And also we do the partial um, read mapping of the trunks and we pipeline them after we uh, base call all of the trunks and uh, uh, do the read quality control of all the trunks. And uh, we finish by um, do the last of, uh, of the read mapping uh, computation on, on the read. Then, as you can see, we can save a lot of computation cycles here. Yeah. So my question is, um, if you try to compute the quality control by chunks, does it differ if you try, would this read will still be rejected if you do it at the big granularities like done in the standard pipeline, for example? It's the, it's the same. We don't change the, uh, because for the, uh, as it, uh, I mentioned before in the read call control, we uh, sum all of the quality scores and uh, we calculated the mean value of the quality scores. And here we sum uh, the quality scores of the first trunk, uh, sum the ne next trunk, and the end we calculate the mean value. Oh. So it's the same. Oh. Yeah. We don't change anything here. Good. Yeah. So yeah. I have one question. So in conventional pipeline, we can also overlap the quality control of read and read mapping while you are base calling another read because you're not going to probably base call only and for one sample. I mean, when you have several, you know, many requests and you want to uh, analyze them. So basically what I'm saying that uh, doing this uh, computation in lower granularity that you have here in chunk, mm -hmm. I mean, what would be the opportunity compared to the case that I mentioned that you can basically overlap base calling of one read of the two, uh, yeah, with, with the quality of check and read mapping of uh, the, the previous reads basically. 
Yeah. And, um, uh, and for the chunk size, if we reduce its size, mm -hmm. I mean, as much as we can, I mean, does it help or there should be some barrier? Okay, very good questions. So firstly, let me answer the first question. Um, why are we doing the trunk size? Uh, as you can see, uh, always, uh, here we can save the cycles for one read. And when we pipeline all of them, we can also save uh, save cycles. Uh, another, in addition to the saved cycles, we can also uh, provide opportunities for the early rejection. Because uh, as I mentioned before, there are some like reads that already base code, but uh, finally we found that it's useless. Uh, but in the conventional pipeline, we cannot do the early rejection uh, because we already base call all of the trunks. And uh, this is uh, another additional like uh, um, advantages for the uh, trunk-based pipeline. And uh, the, for the second question, uh, yes, we have a threshold for the trunk size because when we uh, reduce the trunk size to a very small size, uh, small small amount like a uh, um, 100 basis. Actually, the does uh, the accuracy of the uh, base caller will reduce a lot because they uh, cannot get uh, enough information in the trunk. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, so we um, we use the uh, 300 basis as a, a baseline because this is a um, analysis that uh, done by the by uh, um, Bonito that uh, say that okay this is the rec recommended uh, uh, trunk and uh, we also do uh, more analysis on the trunk size in the paper and you can mm -hmm. uh, look into the details. More one question: Do you map? Uh, do you take the small chunks and then you join them and then you map, or you map the small chunks? Yeah, we uh, for the read mapping there are many steps in the read mapping the uh, the seeding and the chaining and the alignment. There are some of the computation that, for example, the seeding we can down uh, independently of the, the whole reads that we down here. And uh, uh, for there are some like uh, uh, the chaining also, we can get uh, some information uh, based on the trunks and to see, uh, to predict if a, a read can be mapped to the reference journal. Yeah. But for the alignments, you need basically. We, we can utilize this information. And for the alignment, we need the whole reads. Okay. Yeah. And basically, what is remaining after assembly is alignment. alignment yes. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any questions? Okay. Then I continue with the uh, next uh, key technique of Gene Pip is early rejection. So early rejection stops the execution of uh, on the um, useless reads as early as possible by using a small number of trunks to predict this read is going to be uh, useful or not. So early rejection predict uh, uh, and uh, eliminate low quality and unmapped reads from the genome analysis pipeline as early as possible. Uh, here, I want to uh, show you the flow of this early rejection. First, we base call a small number of trunks. Then we check the average quality score of these trunks. And if it fails, then we stop analysis. If it passes, then we base call more trunks. And after that, we map the base call trun trunks so far and check the mapping score. And if it fails, then we stop analysis. And if it passes, then we continue with the base calling the remaining the trunks. And then uh, after that, we execute the remaining computation in the whole read. As you can see here, uh, early rejection includes the early rejection based on the trunk quality scores which predicts the low quality reads using the trunk quality scores. And the early rejection based on the trunk mapping scores, which predicts the unmet reads using trunk mapping scores. And uh, here uh, I go to a little bit uh, detail about the trunk quality scores. So um, when we do this, the goal is to accurately uh, estimate the quality of the entire read by checking the quality of a small number of uh, sample trunks. And uh, here is the example. On the left side, we show a low quality reach, and the, the, each point is a, a, a trunk uh, score, and the, the uh, x axis is the trunk ID, and the y axis is the trunk quality score. And for the low quality reads uh, and the high quality reads on the right, you can see we observe uh, 
to see the first one is the range of the quality score for the trunks extracted by uh, from from the high quality reads is greatly higher than uh, that from the low quality reads. So that's provide the, our uh, the, the opportunity for us to uh, judge the guess the quality scores using uh, using several trunks. And the second observation is that a single trunk's quality uh, score is not enough to predict the read quality score because, as you can see on the uh, left side, there are many trunks whose quality score are larger than seven. So uh, the third observation is that we cannot actually use the consecutive trunk quality scores um, that are, uh, because they are usually close to each other. And indicating that sampling consecutive trunks may not be representative enough to estimate the quality of the entire reads. So <laughs> we use the uh, some uh, samples that are not uh, close to each other. So uh, we conclude that we want to sample a small number of non-consecutive trunks evenly in the read to predict the read quality. Yes. So in addition, so what I understand from the uh, early rejection part is one of the advantages to improve the quality of the read. Is there also another advantage that the further steps could be, uh, you could speed up the further steps, uh, the next steps, uh, say maybe read alignment or something, if you have a good quality read? Uh, actually, no, because we just want to field out the uh, low quality reads and uh, there's no acceleration. Uh, on the high quality reads, yeah. I mean, the, the acceleration may come from the fact that you are not aligning based on this. There is no alignment for these reads that you filter out. Yes, it's so, based on yeah. on this thing. It's not the for the uh, all of the high quality reads. We we don't have any uh, like uh, uh, acceleration for the uh, read quality control. Yeah. So, what is your uh, methodology for sampling? Uh, we sample them evenly from the read because uh, based on our three observations. Um, I think and and basically the number of samples. Oh yeah, uh, we actually studied the uh, uh, for example we uh, studied the E. coli and the, the human uh, uh, samples offline, and uh, we use this uh, sample the the. Uh, number of uh, trunks for uh, for the um, let's say the human or the uh, virus. Yeah, we just done once for each uh, series. Okay, thank you. <coughs> is, is there any opportunity to to to, to make uh, your sample better by exploiting systematic errors, for example, on long on on reads? Basically, if you know how systematically these errors are uh, happens, so you could improve the way you sample them by almost sample this location where you know errors will be there. Mm, you mean that if we know um, we know exactly the uh, errors it's, here? There's some sequence machines, and basically they sometimes introduce uh, systematic errors. So mm -hmm. there's a, a way you can predict, for example, at a particular position, for example, some some for some data, mm -hmm. it's always at the end of the read where you have most errors. Yes, yes, that's why we avoid uh, actually uh, for the pre-processing, we actually uh, already avoid this uh, part. For okay. Yeah. okay, can you explain more? Uh, something like a. Um, he mentioned that uh, we usually uh, may have some like a uh, low quality in at the at, at, uh, in, in the beginning or the end, okay. and uh, uh, if we sample them uh, all at the end, so it's like uh, uh, not very reasonable to judge the entire read, but we sample it evenly. We okay. avoid to sample that all at the end. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, so uh, the key insight, the next one is the uh, early ejection based on trunk mapping. The key insight of the early ejection based on trunk mapping is the uh, reads uh, probably cannot be mapped to the reference genome uh, if enough consecutive trunks in this read cannot be mapped to the reference genome. 
So mapping of small chunks provides too many possible mapping informations. So we need, uh, we firstly sample a small number of consecutive chunks here in the read, and then merge these small consecutive chunks into a big chunk and map this big chunk into reference uh, to the uh, reference genome to predict whether this read can be mapped or not. And so um, I want to uh, talk a little bit more about the information of CP and ER. And CP and ER can be applied on different systems, CPU, GPU, and PIM. And we implement CP and ER using PIM since PIM is more efficient to reduce the data movement. And also we can um, between uh, genome analysis steps. And also we can um, apply CP and ER on CPU and GPU baselines and uh, uh, observe speed up and uh, energy savings because it can uh, better reduce the data movement, also uh, quickly uh, reject uh, the uh, useless reads. Okay, then let's go to more details about the gene pip implementation. For the gene pip, we have three modules, the base calling module, the read mapping module, and the gene pip controller. First of all, we uh, receive the raw signals from the sequencing machine and we store them in the EDRAM. And we read the, uh, we send the signal chunks into the in-memory base call caller. And then we get the base quality uh, scores and we use the pin uh, chunk quality score calculation unit that we propose uh, to calculate the, the uh, quality scores and we uh, forward both the base port trunks and trunk quality scores to the gene pip controller. And if we pass uh, here, firstly, let, let me continue with the, all of the, uh, uh, the, the steps that I talked about earlier rejection. And then uh, it sends the trunks to the in memory read mapping units. And uh, uh, after that, we <laughs> have the read mapping control, then the read mapping result and the store in the storage. Here, as you can see, we have the average uh, calculate on the gene pip controller. We can get the uh, quality scores and we have the ER controller to, um, to compare the quality scores with the threshold. If there is early rejection, uh, then we send a signal to the base calling module and we also get uh, have the Remapping score from the remapping controller. And uh, if there's early rejection, we send the uh, early rejection signal to base, uh, base calling module and the remapping module to, store, uh, to stop the analysis on the current read. So these are the uh, units that we proposed, and you can get more details in our paper. And I want to uh, go a little bit in detail about the in memory seeding, here we enable the. Yeah. So I have, sorry. So here you have uh, basically different in memory accelerators. Mm -hmm. um, so are you using different memory technologies or I mean, all of them the uh, same technology? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are using different memory technologies. For example, we uh, for the base color, we use the SOT MRM for the uh, uh, calculation and for the uh, in, in memory reading mapping, we use the R, RM based CAM. Okay, yeah. and uh, so then I have two questions. One yes. is that uh, are these memories are completely? I mean, they are compatible. Yes, uh, they are compatible. Yeah. Okay, and my second question is that so still uh, you need to move data mm -hmm. between different memories, mm -hmm. right? I mean, data movement is happening on chip, which is I mean more efficient yeah. uh, for sure. But have you also ever thought about doing all of these in the same memory technology so that you don't need to basically, mm. basically you can move your data inside the memory also? Yeah, I understand your point, but currently it's not very easy to achieve that mm -hmm. because for different memory technologies, uh, the characteristics is uh, very different. For example, if we want to do the uh, addition and uh, it's more efficient uh, to doing SOT MRAM because the endurance is very high and there's a lot of writes in it. And uh, for the uh, um, for the uh, string matching operation, we need to do it uh, more <laughs> efficiently in the in the um, uh, RM based camp 
and because you can provide a very high parism search operation. But if we um, do the same operation using the, the uh, structure that we use in the in-memory based call uh, to implement the string matching operation, then we need a lot of cycles to do it. And also it's not uh, uh, efficient actually. So basically we have different uh, uh, palm arrays processing using memory arrays for different operations. Okay. Designed for different operations. Yeah. So is so, it possible to use a SOT? SOT is a state in RAM or a state RAM technology? Uh, in RAM or? Yeah, yeah, SDDM. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So isn't it possible to use SOT MRAM for uh, CAM array also? Um, or for example, for in memory read mapping? Yeah, it's about, it's not about the, the, the let's say, the material that you use, it's about the cell design. Uh, we can also use, uh, for example, the uh, uh, MRAM based uh, CAM and PCM based CAM. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So why uh, but the problem is that with the, the cell design and the array design is different to support the uh, different operations. Oh, I see. Yeah. I see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mohamed. Yeah. So is this implementation a hardware implementation or is it a model-based simulation? Uh, it's a model-based simulation. We don't have a, a like hardware on it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then let's go through a little bit detail about the in-memory seeding because we can we but, we but you also uh, use some HDL model. I mean you synthesize some of the parts. Yes, of yes, part, right? uh, only small part of uh, the, the control. <laughs> it's not all about simulation. I mean, yeah. combination yeah. of HDL synthesizing yes, and yes. Armor. Yeah. And uh, uh, for the in-memory seeding, uh, we have an EDM buffer store the base call trunk from the gene pip controller, and we send the trunk to the uh, query stream generator. Uh, here we propose a, a query stream generator to efficiently uh, generate the trunks from a read. Uh, then we query the uh, uh, query the trunks in the RM based camera and we get the address and then we store the possible locations uh, which is the values in the hash table and then we send it the uh, possible locations to the EDM buffer. Then we get a list of possible locations uh, to the read mapping control. So here we can efficiently support high parallel seeding for wrong reads with uh, variable uh, lenses. Uh, one more question. Yeah. Uh, the size of the of the of the camera that you index, particular indexing, what's the size? Is 300 trunk? Is it 300 basis? How do you carry the indexing, the size of the camera? No, query is uh, less than that. It's less than the trunk. Okay. Yeah, it's a sub substring from a trunk. Oh. Yeah. So what is the size of that seed? It's one hundred uh, for for the bits. It's one hundred and eight bits, and uh, we use two bits to store a uh, uh, base. So it's one hundred and eight divided by two, uh, sixty four. Yeah. Is this the standard recommended by? So use it in practice. Uh, it's not very like uh, uh, relative to the to the uh, mechanism actually. Yeah, but the, the size of the camera have different implications, especially for example in the storage uh, of the index that you have. Right? I mean, what, how did you come to that number? Sorry, what? Did so how, why did you pick this number that you have? Is there any particular reason why you pick it that number? Of gamers, for example, your camera size. Yeah, yeah, we uh do the just like uh, the the array size and the, the camera size, and we do the trade off within. Yeah. Okay. So um by tightly integrating uh, all of the genome analysis steps, uh, we can reduce this data movement and. Uh, uh, eliminate the uh, useless computation. Yeah. So let's go to the evaluation. Uh, we do the performance area and the power analysis using, using the simulation and uh, some modeling. 
uh, things. And uh, we use the three baselines uh, here in, the, uh, in this talk, but we have uh, more details in the paper. Uh, CPU, GPU, and the uh, optimistic integration of two PIM accelerators, uh, which we assume uh, which we assume that uh, um, there's no data movement between steps, and assume there's uh, assume the intermediate data uh, causes no overhead. And the data sets we use is E. coli and a human, and you you can find the data sets online. And for the performance, uh, GenePip achieves uh, provides uh, 41 uh, times speed up of a CPU and uh, eight, uh, eight times speed up of a GPU and one time four speed up of a optimistic PIM. And both CP and ER are very cr critical to the uh, speed up as we um, analyze the, and there's more details showing this uh, in the paper. And uh, for the energy efficiency, uh, GMP achieves uh, 32 uh, energy savings over CPU and the 20.8 uh, times energy savings over GPU and 1.37 times uh, energy saving compared to the optimistic team. And the early rejection is especially critical to the uh, energy efficiency because we reduce the resource computation uh, on the um uh, users streets. So here are more uh results about how can we how we uh, do the choose the, the uh sample chunks. And for the early rejection based on the trunk quality scores, we use uh, uh two and five sam sample chunks for E. coli and human data sets respectively, according to the our analysis. And uh, for the early rejection based on trunk mapping. We use uh, five uh, sample chunks for E. coli and three um, sample chunks for the human data set, uh, respectively, for the um, early rejection based on the chunk mapping. As I mentioned before, and also Mohammed mentioned this, this problem, we do all of this uh, offline. And we uh, before we do the uh, things, we already know how many uh, chunks we want to analysis. And we, yeah, sure. So I have one question from this slide and one from previous. Maybe yeah. first I can yeah, ask. Yeah. So for this, uh, uh, so when you're saying it, every rejection is especially critical, do you have uh, some results to back that also? Because I cannot uh, basically. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, realize from it's it's not on this uh, okay. slide, and it's more details in the paper I that we see. show that uh, uh, early rejection is especially critical. I see. Yeah. So basically, you have different version of GenP. GenP that's yes, only yes. CP and yes, we have a different steps to analysis GenP without the CP and ER, GenP with CP and GenP with CP and ER okay. to show the breakdown analysis of the the key techniques. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. And uh, so now we can. Yeah. Sorry. So can you explain the trend here? Uh, for the, for example, every rejection based on the chunk quality scores. Um, so when you increase the number of, for example, uh, sample chunks, um, the rejection yes. ratio is increasing. Yes, yes. Here. Um, um, yeah. Basically, I, I'm curious to know more intuition regarding the trends here and why you basically stop by six. I mean, can't we, I mean, sample more? I mean, does it make sense to sample more chunks? You know, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The same, I have um, the same question for the chunk mapping also. Chunk mapping, yes. So, um, why we can, we can all, uh, of course, sample more chunks, but sample more chunks at the same time means that you do more computation on the reads. That means that our rejection is not very efficient. Uh, mm -hmm. as so, so, we try to uh, minimize the uh, chunks that we sampled. At the same time, I, we want to ensure that we don't uh, reduce the the uh, the, the fa uh, let's say the uh, prediction accuracy. Okay. Yeah. So okay. it's like uh, the uh, core optimization of the uh, numbers of chunks that we sampled and also the uh, prediction accuracy. So overall, when you increase the number of your sample chunks, you are 
increasing the accuracy. Yes, that's true. But at the same time, you're uh, reducing your opportunity to reject. Yes, yes. Early enough. Yes, that's, that's true. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Marvin. So we have more details in the paper and uh, uh, you can uh, download our paper online. Let me conclude our talk uh, today. So the problem we're targeting in this uh, project is that the genome analysis pipeline has large data movement between genome analysis steps. And there's a significant amount of wasted computation on the useless data. So our goal is to tightly integrate genome analysis steps uh, to reduce the data movement between the steps and uh, animate the computation on the useless data. So we propose GenePIP, the first in-memory genome analysis, analysis accelerator that tightly integrates the genome analysis steps. And GenePIP has two key techniques, a trunk-based pipeline and a new early rejection technique. And GMP part performs the state of art software and hardware solutions using CPU, GPU, and optimistic pin. Yeah. So thank you all for listening and uh, uh, discussing about the topic. Yes. And I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. Yeah. We have some time. Okay. Uh, so I have a couple of questions, but maybe. We can first go to this energy results that you are showing. I want to ask something else on the book questions that moment asked. Yeah. So I guess the early rejection is a mostly a software optimization, right? So we can can we implement it on CPUs? I guess yes, the answer yes. is yes, right? Yes, we can. So when you then say uh, ER is especially critical to the energy efficiency, then should we assume that the use of hardware in general isn't really helping to, to basically uh, provide also additional energy efficiency. But what are the percentages over there if I had implemented ER on CPU and also on, let's say, PIN? What would be the comparison between these two? So I'm basically trying to understand the, uh, how much of efficiency is coming from the hardware side as well. Uh, yeah, we have the uh, breakdown analysis, detailed breakdown analysis in the paper, uh, but I can briefly mention here because uh, since we uh, done all of these things in memory, then we can uh, find the the predict the uh, useful reads, uh, useless reads as quick as we can. So we can uh, provide in by in memory processing, we can provide the higher energy efficiency um, to both on the uh, data movement and also on the uh, early rejection technique. And uh, in the paper, you can see there's a uh, um, for the ER on CPU and GPU, and for the ER on the uh, we have more like uh, uh, energy savings for the ER on the in memory computation. Yeah. And data yeah. movement makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So basically, GenPIP uh, without ER, I mean, the, the energy efficiency is similar to. Uh, Optimistic pin, right? Yes. Okay. And then you need ER basically to do that. Yes, yes, true. Um, my other question is um, could, for example, this idea of, I think, like one of the key ideas is, is that the tight integration is basically what is allowing to exploit these optimization opportunities. And we know that we still have downstream analysis in the pipeline, such as assemblers, for example, and many others. So is there some sort of part picture direction on that we can also try to build something more tight, for example, not stop only the mapping and include the rest of the pipelines, for example, so that we can also see if we can exploit uh, potential benefits? Yes, yes, actually it's a very good direction that we can consider about because uh, for this project, we're focusing on the ONT um, analysis, genome analysis. And uh, uh, there are many types of an analysis assembly. Uh, there are also many steps inside it. And also uh, for the metagenomics, we can also um, uh, get a lot of uh, uh, information for each steps and we can do some uh, filtering uh, in each step and we can consider them as a, um, a whole uh, accelerator to um, better like uh, uh, accelerated uh, procedure. Yeah. 
like, for example, it's been proven, for example, I think today, if I'm not wrong, for high fi data, if you then read uh, a deep neural network uh, method, is the most accurate to predict, for example, violence, for example. Um, I think, and also we have now, let's say, two different stages in the pipeline that use neural network. You see any potential optimization, for example, since at the beginning we have, at the end, we also have two potential different neural networks, for example. Uh, could there be any benefit just because we have two different uh, equal computation uh, methods uh, in the same pipeline so that we can now design, um, let's say, primitives, in-memory primitives that try to leverage it at uh, this computation that is in, in these two parts so that we can at the end uh, speed up these two uh, parts of the pipeline. I don't know if it was correct. I don't actually get what's your so, problem here. Uh, we have base scanning yes. that you say is performed by using deep neural network. Uh -huh. um, at the end of one of the many pipelines that we can have, we have violent culling uh -huh. that also can be done by deep neural network. Uh -huh. Can we design primitives for deep neural network that can be generalized for both? Oh, at yeah. At the beginning, at the end, and speed up the, the boat like beginning. Okay, okay, I understand your point. So yes, also uh, I I can say it's yes because it's all for for the deep, uh, deep neural network and uh, the structure for the um the the design of processing using memory for deep neural networks is similar to each other and we can um uh, provide the uh, add some peripheral circuits to support other operations. So I think it can be done in the same array, same kind of arrays. Yeah. We have to use uh, for sequencing data. Can we basically uh, like instead use paper data and still use jumper? If not, what sort of changes would be required? Um yeah that's a very good question if for other um, technologies uh, we cannot use the base calling because the base calling is designed for the uh, it is is uh, designed for the uh, ont reads uh, but we can still use uh, the uh, other parts of uh, the seeding part the um read mapping part of uh, in, in the gene pip yeah but we need kind of like redesign it a little bit. But we can still, still do like chunking and then yes, so yes, then. yes, that's true. And but overall, could it short reads, for example, see any benefit from this implementation? Sorry? Could uh, short reads exploit any benefits or it's mainly for long reads, for example? Mm. You mean the you mean the PIM? The benefits of PIM or the benefits of the uh, structure that we propose? Yeah, the system that you design, you experiment for long read and journal, so I it for different data, different long reads. Mm -hmm. But basically, if you have short reads, what still can be leveraged in this? Yeah, for the short reads, let's see here. Basically, uh, the since the base calling is designed for designed for the ONT reads, and we can still use the read mapping modules for the short reads, and but we need to do some modifications. Yeah. So I think, for example, the early rejection can also still be applied for short reads. Short reads actually, uh, the error, error yeah, yeah. It's, it's very different because it's different technologies. Yeah. So what is the speed up you would expect by not having the chunks over there? So assuming the chunk equal to the read length and you, the only benefit you would get is the hardware acceleration, right? Yeah. You have numbers on that? Yeah, yeah. In paper, we have the gene PIP without ER and without CP. That's the number for only the, the hardware acceleration. I see. Do you have the number? Is it 2X, 10X? I don't have it in the slides. I had. I can check. Yeah, it. yeah, you can check in the in the paper. I see. And how general 
the architecture to different tools because at each of these steps there are many options that you can pick uh, with the cnn you can have rnn quartznet and different configuration likewise with the read mapping you can have different type of seedings uh, instead of minimizers uh, same with the sequence alignment and so on so how general uh, your architecture to those different variations uh, i mean as uh, far as the if if the uh, the analysis is stick on, on the uh, firstly do the base calling and do the read quality control and do the read mapping we can adjust the uh, parameters in the architecture to uh, to support all of these analysis it's not a problem so are there let me ask the question another way are yeah. there um, hardware or design restrictions on the operation that you support. Uh, they should be digital or analog or a uh, certain type of operation that you can perform on the same hardware that you have. Uh, I don't really get your question. Are you asking that uh, uh, the limitations of the hardware side? Yes. Yes, oh, exactly. Uh, yeah, the actually we also that for the the biggest animation is uh, on the in memory read mapping side that we which where we use the um the RM based CAM because the area overhead uh, we also report in the uh, paper is very large and uh, if we um uh, I mean if we analysis a bigger uh, data set and we need to increase the uh, the, in, the the size of the in memory read mapping module and uh, also at the same time we want to pair uh, we want to do the uh, search search operation um, uh, in a really high uh, throughput then we need to consume a lot of energy so the energy consumption and the area consumption on the of the in, in memory reading um, in memory read, read mapping is kind of like a limitation of this architecture. But we also compared with the um, the CPU plus the memory and the GPU plus memory, the area overhead and the uh, the the energy consumption overhead. So basically, for we uh, analysis the most two popular data sets here. But uh, I mean, if there are bigger data sets, uh, there should be some problems of. Uh, on the in-memory read mapping side. I see, that's a great point. Yeah. And uh, the chunking the data, uh, I, I believe it would benefit also the FPGA and GPU designs because sometimes those, the complete, read to, uh, complete read to be moved to the FPGA memory or the GPU memory, it's going to take a lot of time, a lot of memory. Sometimes yeah. it does not fit right there. Yeah, so yeah, having yeah. fixed granularity, might also boost some existing designs. Yeah, yeah, that's actually a very good point that we want to mention here because we uh, do the uh, pipelining on the uh, granularity of a trunk, then we can actually save a lot of uh, uh, on-chip uh, uh, me memory space for uh, to make it uh, like uh, 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 small and uh, to enable the uh, online analysis. Uh, yeah on chip analysis. I see. And if you'd like to consider another base caller from other technologies, uh, can you still do the chunking over there? Mm, the chunk, yes, yes. I, I mean, uh, we cannot do the, uh, we cannot use the in-memory base caller uh, design here because I, I believe that the other technologies have really different base caller. And, uh, but uh, we can do the rest of things uh, in, uh, use the utilize the rest of parts here, but they might uh, the base color might not be that expensive in other technologies, so it might be real time. Yeah, uh, that's I would true. go with the chunks over yeah. the complete yeah. read if you have the complete read ready for you. Yes, yes, we can just remove this part and uh, uh, get the uh, base called chunks to the ADRM and do the uh, rest of uh, steps. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the questions. Yeah. 
Can you comment more on the real time analysis opportunities here since we're just talking about? Yeah, um, since we also have a um, characteristics called the read on tail uh, for the nanopore sequencing, and uh, if we do the quick analysis on the uh, reads that we are sequencing, then we can uh, quickly uh, reject, reject the uh, reads that is not our, our uh, uh, what we want. Uh, so we also save uh, saving the time of sequencing at the same time we accelerate the genome analysis. Okay. Cool. No more question. Are there any questions in YouTube chat? Oh uh, no, not really. Cool. Any more questions from the Zoom audience? Okay, so if there is no more question, I guess we can wrap up today's seminar. Thanks every, everyone for joining and thanks a lot, Hayu, for the nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you all.